From fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. It's an April Fool's Day episode, so we wanted to do something different. So for today, and today only, we will be giving good advice. <laughs> and now, broadcasting from the churn, that guy is Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time for some pod therapy. So when this episode airs, April Fool's Day will have already happened. Yes. And I have... Technically, it's tomorrow, right? It is, yeah. it, in real time. <clears throat> so we're taping this the day before. But when this pops on Therapy Thursday... Uh, it is probably going to have been the case, and I'm still working out the legal kinks, but I want to post something on April 1st, just something random. But, like, have it be, obviously not us, but it shows up in their feed as, oh, Pod Therapy posted a special episode, and then have it be something that's that's annoying. <laughs> and, not, and there it is. It's April Fool's. I'm, I'm all for you posting weird stuff on Twitter. Is there any way you can do it on your Twitter? No, no, I'm not saying Twitter. Twitter. I'm saying in the feed, like literally as an episode. (laughs) So people go, oh, bonus episode. And then it's like, oh, (laughs) they're just idiots. So uh, if that happened to you here in uh, April 4th or whatever it is, that's uh, the Thursday. um, If that happened, then that means that uh, I came up with a good idea and we did it. And if not, I didn't. And if it it didn't happen, (laughs) then it means that uh, I was able to talk him out of it. (laughs) Nick, stop me before I could do that. You have a definition of good ideas. (laughs) It's very broad. It's a very broad thing. It's just different. Yeah. My, My idea filter process is propose things, read the room. (laughs) <laughs> and then wait and then for ignore, people to text me on the way home. Ignore completely what you, what you read in that room. <laughs> Throw out random idea as if it was a good one. Read the room. <laughs> and then if uh, nobody seems to join me in that, then I go home quietly and think about what I'm doing. So. Do you? I, mean, <laughs> I don't think you do. I didn't say it stops me. I think I, I'm aware down. of it. I, I think that's... Down. <laughs> well, uh, so that is going on. And then the other big thing that's happening here in the first week of April is we will probably be getting to the final answers of who's going to win Jim's Sushi Madden. Uh, right now, I am getting Look out. whooped. <laughs> I'm getting whooped. It's going to take a damn miracle. Jacob, you don't have Duke winning at all, do you? No. So if Duke wins it all, I probably I have, have a fighting winning chance. winning it all. That, okay, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to get the champion. That hurt you. So yeah. right now, I'm pretty confident I'm losing to both of you, and the only way out is I need Duke to win the entire tournament. And if that happens... Then I shall be victorious. The problem is, I think, right, because I, I did not follow basketball through the season. Yeah. I have followed the tournament, though. Yeah. And I think Duke's going to lose. Their oh, yeah, me too. I yeah. So too. I think <laughs> they Duke shouldn't be where they are. Game yeah. Texas Tech. They shouldn't be where they yeah. are. Yeah, they've been, like, squeaking by. So yeah. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, pay attention to the Twitters and uh, all the stuff out there, because if I win, I shall be gloating. And if I sh- lose, I shall be weeping. <laughs> <laughs> I'd no, be daddy though. Pretty I think proud of you that. still gloat when you lose. That's too. not true. I, yes, I uh, think it's not true. No, no, he's. Going, I take my lumps. If he loses to me, Jacob gonna, will be gloating. He's gonna yeah. cry. <laughs> Jacob warned me that I'm gonna, I'm gonna before he took the, the bet. I'm gonna lick the tears <laughs> off of Jim's face. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's gonna dip his sushi in. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna force mm. him to feed me sushi <laughs> while I just lick his tears. So my, I need extra tears in this soy sauce, please. <laughs> <laughs> soy sauce isn't salty enough. I have lost to him for the last five, five years, years in yeah. a row. And my dream, if I do win, when I win, because I'm pretty sure I got when, it this time. going to manifest yeah. it. The very first plate of sushi that's going to come to me, I'm just going to throw it on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> that's my plan just, um, thank you make it again and just throw it away give me another one give me another one <laughs> get a get a japanese lasagna just I'll go only... mm, this looks delicious Spoosh. <laughs> oh see i'm gonna i'm gonna make him take me to sushi and then he's gonna find out that i don't even like sushi <laughs> uh, i'll have the barbecue chicken please <laughs> what <laughs> no no i already ate <laughs> I ate earlier. <laughs> I came here straight from In-N-Out. just a table yeah. full of sushi. <laughs> yeah. Well, that looks delicious. All right, guys, take care. <laughs> you should bring me in and out with you. Yeah. Bring that. Just bring it to go. God, that would be awesome. Oh, well, I don't think I'm going to have to find any of this out because I'm just going to put it all in on Duke, and they're going to pull through, guys. You watch. So, Okay. March Madness we'll in full swing. And uh, speaking of uh, all the interesting swings and madnesses out there, we're going to open the show today with what is probably part three 
of our ongoing indefinite series about cognitive behavioral therapy. And I don't even know in what other episodes we've talked about it, but it's come up now several times. And I think we've unpacked a lot. Well, yeah, we actually did a deep dive into it twice on different right. topics. Yes. But I don't know what those episode numbers are. You know, it's interesting because <clears throat> when I do cognitive behavioral therapy in session, I usually roll it out in three parts. And the first part is... Here's the chain reaction of cognitive behavioral therapy, which we're going to recap really quick, which is there's an event. You have an automatic thought or first feeling or emotion. Then you enter into a perspective, which we call a cognitive distortion or a belief. And then you behave, right? So you have anxiety or depression or anger, or in some way you are maladaptive to the situation because you have a false belief. Then in another episode, we broke down a list of those false beliefs, which are called cognitive distortions. And so we went through a whole list of cognitive distortions and dared people to kind of look at that list and think for themselves, is there anything on here that you identify with, anything you have done a lot in the past? And you and I also identified things we've done. So then part three is, okay, once you've identified those distortions, how do you get out of them, right? If you're telling me that there's a false reality that I'm believing in, that I'm falling prey to... How do I break out of that? And that's kind of the magic trick of cognitive behavioral therapy is it teaches us how to question what we think we're seeing so that we can find what is accurate and behave differently. Right. And you and I do this a little bit differently. Yeah. <clears throat> the way you do it is a little bit different than the way I do it. I think that you replace um, automatic thought, don't you? Or how do you? Uh, the, the, the model that I've always kind of used is kind of the four-step process, right. which is the, the event. Yes. The automatic thought. Yes. The emotion behavior. Okay, so the word emotion is is the word I'm using cognitive distortion, which is it's ultimately a false perspective. You shouldn't believe in. Right. Well, but the emotion isn't really a false perspective. Right. The, the emotion is basically our natural our, reaction. Or yeah, our reaction to but I, I break down the automatic thought a little bit differently. Okay. So the automatic thought then is is when we see something that happens or when the event occurs, what is the meaning that we give the event? Right. 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 So that's kind of how that I do it. Instant meaning. Yeah. So yeah. if, if uh, the example I always use, if I'm a little league baseball player and dad doesn't show up for the game. Right. My emotion is sadness. Right. But what is the automatic thought? What the automatic thought from? is the meaning that I give the event. Right. So if, the event itself doesn't mean anything right. until I give it meaning. So if if the meaning I give it is dad's not here because dad doesn't care about me right. or I'm not important enough to dad, then that's what causes the sadness. Exactly. So, if, so yeah. Yeah. So then if you can work on breaking down that automatic thought and challenging that automatic thought, yes. then you can start attributing different meaning to different things. Exactly. And so you and I may construct the pitch a little differently, right. but ultimately the tool it's that the we same. teach yeah. about how then do we break out of something that is not helpful, this is a poor perspective and it's giving us bad results, now we have a way to break out of that. Right. So then the method that you came up with is pause. Right. And so pause is, is uh, me kind of taking all the questions that typically do show up in cognitive behavioral therapy and just restructuring them into a memorable way to sort of teach all the questions so that way people can kind of put it in their pocket. And so that's what we'll kind of run through today. But it's best run through uh, when you have a story to kind of go with it. That way a person can kind of simulate how to use the questions in real time. Okay. And so uh, since we're playing Jim's Neurotic Bingo, Yay! and uh, <laughs> since I always have uh, no shortage of bad stories about my life, we'll start with me. So I will tell a quick story, and then we will use that story for Nick to kind of be my therapist and break me out of my cognitive distortion. So years and years and years ago... Uh, I had a son. Uh, he's still around. <laughs> but uh, It was when he was first born. And at the time, I was a teacher. I taught high school. And uh, I was doing a master's program and all that stuff. But I was, I was a teacher. And so here I was. I was teaching high school. And I had this new kid. And I started having a flare-up in my anxiety. I had anxiety always. But this became a time when I was having a lot more anxiety. And an event happened where I got to go on my quick lunch break and I went across the street and I was at a burger place and I'm parked, I have my burger in my hand and I start calling my wife to check on her because she's home with our infant son and this is my one chance during the day to, to find out how they're doing. Well, the phone rings and it rings and it rings and she doesn't answer. And I immediately have this image in my mind of my wife uh, carrying my infant son down the stairs of our house and slipping somehow and falling down the stairs and landing on our linoleum kitchen floor and both of them dying. Basically just hitting the floor in some kind of dangerous, catastrophic way and dying. And me getting home and seeing everybody I love is dead. 
and I could have saved them. And that was where I was at as that phone was ringing and her not answering. And if you were paying attention just now to the little thing about how Nick and I just taught about how this chain reaction happens, you can see that entire chain reaction happening. What's the event? Jim's phone's ringing. Nobody's answering. What's Jim's automatic thought? Uh, something dangerous has happened. Oh my God, my people are in danger. What's Jim's distortion? If you remember our list, catastrophizing. I'm imagining that the worst possible explanation for this is what's true, that my people are dead. And so what was the result? I had an anxiety attack. And I had that anxiety attack in the car. But that's not where it ends. (laughs) I freaked out so hard that I started my car and I drove 100 miles per hour on the 215, went all the way across town, 45 minutes, ditched work, Students showed up to my class waiting for Mr. Jobin. No Mr. Jobin. No principal knows where the hell Jobin is. Nobody knows anything. Kids are just waiting around for a teacher. There's no teacher. So there were some winners in this. (laughs) (laughs) So the kids ended up walking out here. But I freaked the hell out. Tunnel vision, the whole business, dizziness, gasping for air, drove myself all the way to my house, drove my car over uh, the ledge of uh, the curb of my my driveway or whatever into the yard. (laughs) No, this really happened. (laughs) Threw the e-brake on, ran to the door. I'm like staggering. I don't have the fine motor skills to like get my keys in the door. And so like I'm I'm jammering everything, dropping keys. I'm I'm screaming. I'm and I'm like putting the and I was calling my wife the whole time while I'm driving, you know. And so I get my keys in the in the door and I throw open the door. My wife's car is in the driveway, so I know she's home. I throw open the door. I run into the living room, and I'm screaming her name. You know, where are you? Where are you? She's not there. I run into the kitchen. She's not there. I'm screaming her name. I'm gasping for air. I ran upstairs. I go into the baby's room. It's dark. No baby in there. Nobody's there. I run into the loft. I'm screaming, where are you? I can't find them. I run into the bedroom, and nobody's there. And it was right about that time that I hit my knees, and the room started going dark. And that's when my wife opened up the master bathroom. She was holding my infant son in a towel. And she looked at me and said, Jesus, not again. I had done it three times. <laughs> and my principal looked at me and, and basically wow. when I got back to work after that, my principal was like, Jim, we like you a lot. You're a nice guy, but you're not okay. Like you need to, you need to get right. And so I started doing therapy and I, I, this is where cognitive behavioral therapy changed my life because the next time that I found myself in my car calling my wife, I asked myself the series of questions that we're going to practice today. And it was because of those questions that I was able to get that anxiety under control. And after years of practice, today, if my phone rings and I see my wife's name, I am going to have that automatic thought, oh, my God, they're in danger. Right. But now I start asking myself the questions of pause, and that brings me back to my reality so I don't misbehave. Yes. And I think that's a good point, too, is that – the way a person can apply this and their expectation isn't necessarily that the initial problem is going to go away. Right. It's a way of dealing with dealing the with problem. It. It's so a tool. you you're right. So the anxiety doesn't disappear. No. You just develop skills around how to function with it. Yes. And so what we're gonna practice right now, these questions, guys, these are useful for depression, they're useful for anger, they're useful for addictions. They're useful if you find yourself maladaptive and your behavior, your outcomes do not align with reality. And so for me, it's it's a, a home run for my anxiety. So what we're going to do is we're going to – Nick's going to be my therapist, and he's going to walk me through, and I'm going to answer these questions as if I was in my car sitting there in front of a (laughs) jack-in-the-box on Cheyenne (laughs) and Durango and uh, and trying not to have an anxiety attack. Okay. So the acronym is PAUSE, P-A-U-S-E. So P is prediction. So what is the worst possible outcome? Okay. What is the worst possible thing that could happen? My family's dead. My family has fallen down the stairs. Something bad's happened. The reason she's not answering this phone is because something terrible has happened, and I'm all alone now. And then, can you technically live through that? And that's always a hard one to answer, because it's like, oh my god, I can't imagine myself living through it, but it's it will not medically kill me. So, yes. Usually the thing I ask myself is, Jim, is this a bullet? Is this technically a bullet? No. I don't know how to go on, but yeah, the worst thing could happen is they're they're gone, and no, that would not technically kill me. So continuing on with prediction, then what is the best possible outcome? They're not dead. <laughs> okay, what else? What? <laughs> what? What? I mean, what? Beyond that, what could possibly be a <laughs> right. possible outcome? Because I, it's always like, oh, just the bad thing doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. So what? <laughs> 
<laughs> like, come uh, on, what, buddy. Okay, so what instead of right. them not dying? What, yes. what could be going on instead of that? Yeah, so instead of, so anytime you're asking yourself this question, guys, you're going to be tempted to do what I just did, which is when somebody, you ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen? This. What's the best? Not this. And it's like, <laughs> that's not the, the truth of what best means, right? Best means opposite of worst, right? So it, your entire family being dead is unreasonably bad. <laughs> Like, right. that is once-in-a-lifetime bad, right? So you need once-in-a-lifetime good to counteract that. So best-case scenario, okay, my wife's not answering the phone because uh, she hit megabucks this morning, and she's packing up everything, and uh, we're going to have this huge reveal when I get home, and uh, there's going to be a Lambo in the yard, and she's going to say, hey, welcome home. I turned off my phone because uh, we just won the lottery or whatever, and we're going on vacation, and confetti falls from the sky, so essentially going from the absolute worst case to yes. the absolute best case. Yeah, because my worst is unreasonably bad. So the best needs to balance that out. And the way to think about it is almost like a Cartesian graph. My worst is a negative five. The opposite of negative five is not zero. The opposite right. of negative five is positive five. Right. <laughs> so it needs to be unreasonably good to kind of counterbalance that. So worst case, my family's dead. Best case, uh, Mega Bucks, Lottery, Lambo, Cruise. The reason she's not answering the phone is because... Private Island. Private Island. Okay. She, was, she was booking our flights to Hawaii, and uh, that's why she wasn't answering Got the tickets phone. to Fire Festival. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Best case. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And then what is the most realistic scenario? Most realistic outcome. Right. So it won't look like either of those. It right. won't look like they're dead, and it won't look like we won the lottery. The most realistic is usually what's happened in the past. And so she's not answering the phone because she's busy. She's a new mom. She's napping. And when I get home, I'll find out that she was busy and her phone was off. And she's napping or she's giving the kid a bath. Mm -hmm. Just like last time. (laughs) Just like the last time I showed up and passed out. She was just bathing the kid. So, yeah, that's probably the most realistic. Okay. So then we move on to the A, which is alternation. Yes. Um. How are you currently describing the problem or the situation? And so this one is one that I usually have a lot of fun with. So the joke I usually tell people is, if right now, outside of our door, you started hearing the clapping hoofs, and this is me simulating it. (laughs) You start hearing the clapping hoofs of an animal coming down the hallway. And I look at you and I say, oh my gosh, do you hear that animal? And you're like, yeah, I hear it. And I'm like, you know what that is, right? You're like, yeah, yeah, four clapping hoofs, heavy, yeah, going down a hallway. Well, no, it's a zebra. Well, how, how do you know it's a horse? It, I mean, it could be a zebra. You don't know. What if it's a zebra? <laughs> it's like, if my explanation was it's a zebra, that is so rare and exotic. Like, you didn't say unicorn. You didn't say something that's make-believe. Zebras yeah. are real. But I wouldn't put money on zebra. <laughs> like, probably it could be not. a monkey yeah. <laughs> riding a zebra. That would almost be as likely. <laughs> almost be as likely. Okay. So whenever we do alternation, we ask ourselves, well, how are you currently describing this? And is that like a zebra explanation? Is that rare and exotic and not impossible, but really improbable? And then we ask ourselves the opposite of that, which is the second question of alteration. How could you describe this differently? And that's a a more boring and usual way. Yeah. What's the horse explanation? So as I'm sitting there in my blue truck and I'm asking myself, I had a blue truck, I had a little blue Nissan XE back in this day. So I'm, I'm channeling realism here. And you ask me, all right, Jim, what is uh, what is the way you're interpreting this situation? Your wife's not answering the phone. How are you interpreting this? Well, I'm interpreting it that she and everybody I love is dead. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's not impossible, Jim. That's not a unicorn. But that's definitely once in a lifetime. That's zebra, right? So right. Mm, I can't prove that that's not what happened. But is there a horse way to describe this? Right. Yeah, she's a new mom, and she's not answering the phone. <laughs> right. That's more boring. Yeah. So a good trick with alternation is if the way you're experiencing this problem would make a good movie, you're probably getting it wrong. If somebody would watch the movie version of what you think is happening, you're probably adding way too much drama and way too much zebra to this. Get it to a place where nobody would watch that movie, and now you're probably describing real life. Okay. Um, so then moving on to you. Yeah. Understanding. Understanding. Okay. So we're looking at how you understand or what is your understanding of the situation? Yes. So if if you choose not to believe the feeling, uh, what might you do? Okay. So if I choose not to believe my fear that my, my family's dead, I guess I would go about my business. I would pick up and I would go to work and I would finish my lunch 
I would listen to NPR because <laughs> right. I didn't podcast back then. And I would go to work and I'd teach the next class. I'd tell the school secretary, hey, I'm worried about my wife. Can you keep giving her a ring? And then message me in my room whenever you get a hold of her. Right. And I would just go about my day. And what would you do if you choose to believe the fear? If I choose to believe the thing that scares yes. me, I will do what I always what do. You did. I will get in the car. I'll drive 100 miles per hour desperately and uh, try to save my family from peril even though they're fine. And probably lose my job and probably put them in actual financial peril because I'm overreacting. Or get in a car accident on the way there. Or kill somebody, or kill on, the somebody on the way there. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you compare, like, left hand to right hand on that one? It's like, okay. Because it's a choice. I would choose to believe this or I could choose not to believe this. If I choose not to believe this, my day is going to be normal. And I'll just okay. do the next right thing. So, S is suggestion. Yes. So, if you had another, if you had a friend, uh, somebody close to you who was in this exact same situation, what advice would you offer? When I used to pr- do this actual simulation, I'd call Eddie. So I, in my mind. So I'd actually hold my phone in my head because we didn't have Bluetooth back then. So I'd hold my phone in my head because I didn't want people to think I was crazy talking to myself in my car. And I would actually pretend to call Eddie. And so I'd call Eddie and, you know, I'd say, Eddie, calm down, buddy. And I'd imagine Eddie telling me, like, hey, man, I'm really scared. My wife's answering the phone. You know, my baby's there. Like, what if she's hurt? And I would talk him down, and I'd say, Eddie, buddy, you're a new dad. You're a new dad, man. You're just worried, okay? All new dads feel like this. You're just scared. You're not able to see them. It's hard to be at work all day and not know how they're doing. They're fine, man. She's a grown woman. She knows how to take care of herself. She knows how to take care of this kid better than you do. Just chill out. Tell your secretary at the front desk to give her, you know, her, her a call. Calm down. Don't make it worse by overreacting, okay? You're just a scared dad right now. It's all this is. It's going to be mm-hmm. fine. Your, your wife's fine. Everybody's fine. So that always makes me feel better, too. Right. <laughs> Eddie was always my make-believe guy <laughs> in my head. <laughs> so moving on to E, evidence. What evidence is there that your feelings are true beyond a shadow of a doubt? So this is what you always call putting the thought on trial or taking yep. it to court. Taking the thought to court. Yep. So, okay, where's the evidence that my family really is in danger? Hardcore, court-admissible evidence. Yes. Well, she's not answering the phone. That I got that. And right, <laughs> Which, and would that convince a jury that she is dead, Your Honor? <laughs> I tell you that this person's a murderer. How right. do you know? Because I called the the victim earlier, and they didn't answer the phone. <laughs> right, so they obviously are dead. <laughs> like, okay, so so Not basically, very court admissible. With this, what you're trying to do is you're trying to. Make it clear to yourself that yes. you're jumping from like a five to a three thousand two hundred seventy eight. Yes, like that, you're skipping a what lot. What would an outsider of, say? A lot of steps there. Yeah, you're about to react as if something were true. Would a judge agree? You right. know, what would the jury say? And so, where's my evidence? Uh, I guess I don't have any affirmative evidence to prove this, except that somebody's not answering a phone. Right, and then so. we reverse it. Yeah, so then what evidence do you have that this is not true or that would cast doubt on your fear? Because you got to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And it's right. like, okay. And so I imagine the other attorney saying, Your Honor, there's no phone calls from the police. There's no, there's nobody waiting at his school to let him know something terrible has happened. Uh, she, the, the family members are not sick. They're not in some state of peril right now. Does your wife have a history of falling down Right. The is, there's no, like, some kind of disorder that causes falls. Like, <laughs> n- none of these evidences are there. So you're just plucking this out of nowhere. There's not right. even something that would lead to this assumption. <laughs> and so, no, beyond your, your imagination... There is no evidence, and so there's actually a lot of evidence to the contrary because of the absence of positive evidence, which is court admissible. All right. of that would be court admissible. No missed phone calls, no emergency calls, no 911s, uh, nothing that would lead to this assumption, nothing that would even give plausibility to this assumption, and that mm-hmm. would be court admissible evidence. Mm-hmm. So after you complete pause, then you kind of summarize to yourself, and you say, okay, how do you feel now? And before you start pause, you ask yourself a lot, like, what percentage do you believe this fear right now? What percentage? And at the time, I would have said 100%. I have no doubt in my head that my family's in danger. Right. And at the end of pause, I'd be like, well, uh, like 50%. And if you're, if you're there, then you ask yourself, okay, what are you going to do next? And if the answer isn't get on with your day, then you do pause again. <laughs> and you just run it back, and you do it over and over and over again until you feel better. <laughs> right. So pause is a really cool technique, and that is officially Chapter 3 of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Uh, these are the, the tools that we use once we're encountering a distortion, once we are having a, an ab reaction. Ask yourself that series of questions so that we, you're seeing the world accurately, and that way you can get yourself right so you don't overreact. Now, what would this look like uh, going on further into therapy? Because 
what we did here is an exercise to deal with the anxiety right now in the moment. Right. If I was really your therapist, then once we've learned that skill and you're able to deal with that on a regular basis, right? then I want to back up a little bit and then I want to look into belief systems. Right. Where do those ideas come from? Yeah. Yeah. When when this happens, how how is that the first thing that pops into your mind? Right. Where does that come from? Right. And start to challenge the origination of the idea as well as the results of the idea. Yes. Yeah. That's the deeper dive. We'll save that for chapter four <laughs> of our ongoing and unlimited series on cognitive behavioral therapy all right we're going to take a break when we come back we will discuss family fallout after a death you're listening to pod therapy this week's their producer sponsor is nathan's hot dog scoop who submitted a uh, following statement <clears throat> to whom it may concern first item i demand an apology for the excessive giggling during the last list of demands whoever let that inconsiderate yet mirthful ch- mirthful child into the studio while jim was reading should be thoroughly reprimanded demand number two the following quote is without question <laughs> Likely a true representation of a real quote. Quote, UNC is just amazing and its terrible March Madness is ending without their outstanding talent on display. There is absolutely no joy in watching Zion Williamson carry the inadequate Duke team through yet another limping game that should be easily won but is simply handed over through luck instead of skill. I, Dr. Jim Tobin, <laughs> truly believe this go Tar Heels. The final demand of the day is as follows. Either by appointment or a council or through other means such as private investigator or freelance vigilante superhero, I demand an inquiry into the possibility, though that should be read as a certainty, that Nick and Jim are in fact the same person living in a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde existence. The input of Jacob the audio guy should be wholly disregarded in this case as he is most likely a victim of Jim, the obvious Mr. Hyde in this case, and his testimony could only be considered given under duress. Further demands will follow as necessary. With sincere thanks to my willing subjects, Nathan's Hot Dogs Goop. If you'd like to join Nathan and make the show possible, you can go to www.patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy therapy (laughs) all right we're back you're listening to pod therapy our next question is about family fallout after death hey nick and jim i started listening with my girlfriend after attending scoop fest we're looking forward to hopefully joining the next pod therapy lunch also russia 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 (laughs) oh wait are we russia no we were yeah we're russia Yeah. yeah we're not dragon yeah dragons for crap Yes, I like this person. Now, for my actual email. I joined the Dead Mom Club at 12. Unfortunately, I joined the Dead Dad Club at the ripe old age of zero. And my grandmother, who was the only one who actually raised me, died when I was 20. My uncle just died. I only just found out he was in the hospital this week when I took a break from kicking children, I'm a Taekwondo instructor, to (laughs) upload pictures of the children I kick to our school's Facebook And before I was able to switch to the school page, I saw my cousin's status update. My uncle went to the hospital with stomach pain just over a week ago, only to find out he has stage 4 liver cancer. I immediately called my cousin to see how she, her mom, and my uncle were doing. I texted all three, Facebooked, and Instagram messaged. No responses. I only got through because I called the hospital. My cousin picked up the phone and said she was swamped with all the people who were showing up and that they had to talk to the doctors about hospice, but she said she'd contact me back. The next two days, I keep contacting her, and I kept getting no responses or getting the I'll get back to you. Last night, I got a text saying they were moving him from hospice today. Not hearing anything, I call and text during and after work. I then log on to Facebook and see that my uncle has passed away shortly after getting home. I'm mad. I live in New York City, but said on Tuesday I was ready to fly out to Atlanta. She never really contacted me or my aunt, who besides losing my mom slash her baby sister and her mom slash my grandmother, just lost her younger brother. None of us got a call, and I was the only one relaying info from Facebook to my aunt and my siblings. I'm mad at my cousin, 
who's in her mid-twenties, and my aunt, who's in her sixties, for not reaching out to us so we could see him. I'm mad at myself for not just flying Tuesday night and going straight to the hospital because I knew they'd be like this. I'm the one who always reaches out to small amounts of family members I have left and reach out and I'm ready to let go of my cousin and aunt. They've come up with my uncle and not told us. They've gone through Florida where my aunt lives and not told her. There's part of me that just wants to fix our relationship, but then there's part of me that is just done. Thoughts. F-F-Y-I-T-F, Max the Ginger Scoop. Boy, that is a tough one. Jeez. You know, top of the board there, Max. I'm so sorry for your loss, man. It's terrible. Yeah, and I think this is actually a really good... um... Thank you for writing in. I think this is yeah. a good question to actually follow up with what we just talked about. Oh, with pause. Because, not necessarily the pause part, but in Jim's example right. of of what had happened, right? So, event happened, led to an automatic thought. Right. That automatic thought for Jim was very destructive, mm. right? And that influenced emotions and behaviors. What leads to that automatic thought. The automatic thought is created from a belief system. Right. It's our view of how the world functions. Right. Right? So when an event happens, we filter it through our belief system, and then that's how we get that automatic thought, that automatic reaction. So we have to be aware of where do our belief systems come from. Belief systems are created through past experiences. And that's super evident in this letter. Exactly. Because you started off the letter really kind of talking about the death that you've already experienced in your life, right? Mother died. Dad died. Grandma died. Grandma died. Yeah. So that's the first thing that I would kind of challenge you on is be aware of the filter that this event is going through. True. That is creating the emotion and is likely going to influence your behavior. You're talking about cutting out family members. Right. Well, if all of this is coming from, you know, through that filter, Mm -hmm. be aware of that, you know, because had you not experienced loss at such a young age, your filter could have been completely different. You could have interpreted this situation completely different. Would have maybe ended with different emotions, and your behaviors might be different. Yeah, and there's no we're not we're not in any way, Max. Uh, you know, minimizing what this young twenty something did or your aunt did. Um, and I do want to, in a second, pivot to kind of reflecting on what they may have been experiencing and, and and kind of putting some things in context. But I like Nick what you're starting with, which is Max. Let's start with you, okay? Let's start with just your perspective in a vacuum, not qualifying the the rights and wrong behaviors of these other people. Right. Just you in a bubble. And and what we're first noting is you definitely have a, a history of having some very traumatic experiences surrounding the idea of death. And death has robbed you. And it has happened quickly. And it has happened in a, in a way that does not allow you any control or consent or even awareness of it. And so you, while death affects all of us and is very terrifying to see anybody suffer what I think Nick's pointing out is you are abnormally at risk for being exp- – like to, to experience this very differently and to be put in a position where you are incensed and mad and scared and fearful and, and, and probably more exposed than other people are. And so if this moment and this experience feels really big to you and other people are even telling you, you know, maybe maybe you're overreacting. If, if you are hearing that at all, we're coming alongside you to say, here's here's where the proportion of this happens in your mind. Here's why your first reaction is huge. Look at your history. Look at where this comes from. Yeah, and it, it doesn't mean that your reaction is wrong. Not at all. Yeah, no. It doesn't mean your feelings are wrong. We're just starting with you. Yeah. 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 So I want to make that clear because when we get into this and we really kind of focus on you, like, so for example, if you were my patient and I was working with you, the stuff with they did this or they said this or they didn't say this or they didn't communicate this. Right. I immediately just kind of take that and I put it on the back burner. Exactly. And the reason why isn't to to not validate it. It's still important. And you're probably right. And then the way that you feel about it is probably right. But there's nothing we can do about it right now. Right. So I take that, I put it on the back burner, and then I come back to you. Okay, let's talk about you and your experience with death. Yeah. Your experience with death, how has that influenced how you see current situations? Mm. You know, and because, again, it goes back to the meaning, right? Events 
don't have meaning until we give it a meaning. Right. So somebody important, somebody close to me, somebody in my life died and so-and-so didn't communicate it to me. I could have been there, but now I can't. Right. What is the meaning that you're giving this event? Yes. Because that is ultimately what's driving the emotion. Because the meaning could be anything. The, the meaning could be, you know, they disrespect me. Or right. they don't care about me. Yes. Or they, you know, and all that. And then whatever that meaning is, that's creating the emotion. So yes. how, do I, how do I feel when I feel segregated from my family? So, Max, to, like, piece this back to all the different chapters of cognitive behavioral therapy that we've done, Nick just explained the chain reaction. And now we might turn to the list of cognitive distortions and say, hey, Max, is there one that maybe we're doing? And there's one in there called mind reading, which is, like, assuming the motivations and intentions of other people based on how we're affected by them, right? And so, you know, that's very dangerous because at the end of your letter, you say, you know, I'm so sick of this. I'm so sick of the selfishness in them that I feel personally attacked and it's causing me to want to pull away. And and the fact that you're ready to behave in that way implies that there's a lot of beliefs about their intentions and what they could and couldn't do and, and their own humanity. And so I would probably lean on that and say, let's take a look at that, right? Because that's mm-hmm. a known glitch in the human brain. And that's where we would start fiddling with some of the questions of pause, not the worst and best one, because obviously that wouldn't apply here, but maybe the zebra one and asking, hey, we're, we're, we're hearing noise on the other side of that door, right? And we don't know for sure what their intentions were. We don't know for sure what their motivations were, but what's the zebra explanation? And the zebra explanation is, oh my gosh, they're horrible, inhumane, they're despondent, they don't care for others, they, they, they're just selfish or they're lazy, I would watch a movie about that kind of a character. That's, that's horrible. But what's the horse explanation? Well, they were inundated. They're, that they're telling the truth, that this happened fast for them too. That the uncle went into the hospital for stomach pain and now they're about to lose him. And there's no way they were prepared for that. And, and the, the, the correctness of alerting the social network or alerting the family network was something that fell so beyond their ability to even keep up with that it was the last thought they had. They were just trying to sap up the last moments they had and also be his caretakers and guardians and navigate the information as it came and navigate, maybe. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the horse explanation. The zebra is that this is, like, punishable. The horses, they are victims, too. And that would be a terrible movie, but it wouldn't be an interesting one. That's a a common human story. People are absolutely smashed by truth they can't understand and they don't know what to do with it. Right. And so, Max, I hope that uh, by listening to this, you get the message that uh, we're not saying that you're wrong. Not at all. Not saying, I mean, you could be completely right about all of this. Uh, I think think what we're trying to do right now is challenge some of the thoughts before you make a decision on behavior. Yes. Yes. Because the, the thoughts... We can have thoughts, we can stop thoughts, and they keep in our head and no one else knows about them until they turn into behaviors. Right. Behaviors we can't undo. So before you decide that you're going to kind of disassociate and cut off family members, um, let's run that, you know, play that tape through a little bit longer. Right. You know, and what, what are the possible outcomes? Are there ways that we can avoid this? Are there other alternatives or different ways of looking at it that maybe we're not considering? Um, it's all kind of that issue of perspective, not to say that your perspective is wrong at the end of the day, you could be completely right. And maybe cutting them out is the right answer for you. So let's speak to that because that's a good question. Cause he does say, Hey, at the end of this thing, he says, listen, guys, this isn't an isolated incident, right? There's been other times when they're passing through, they're bringing family through, they don't talk to us. And I'm feeling like, okay, like that's enough data. Like I want to react to this. So, Max, I think our, you know, obviously we just came off of pause and CBT, so we're going to apply your story to that, you know, try Mm -hmm. to use that filter actively. But now let's talk about your actual proposal here. Should you cut these people off? I'm always very reluctant to do stuff like that. And Nick has a thing about, what's your thing about the boundary you can't enforce or something? Like never... Oh, never set a boundary that you can't enforce. Yeah, never yeah, draw the line you won't actually live up to. Yeah, it's better to have no boundaries than to have a boundary that you can't enforce. And we do this at families all the time. People are like, I'm done. I'm done with Aunt Jessie. You know, I'm done. She said this terrible thing at Thanksgiving. I'm done. Or she didn't send us uh, my kids a Christmas card this year. I'm done. Um, and so we got to be careful with this because it's a line we're not usually going to enforce. Mm-hmm. And we also have to be really careful because while there are good reasons for removing toxic family members from your life permanently, it takes a lot to identify why that needs to be done. 
And these guys have very little contact with you. And so severing the last strings of contact, I don't know where the benefits are of that, except as some kind of like retribution or feeling of vengeance or feeling of like satisfaction. And while I totally understand the temptation of that right now, Max, I'm sensing your heart saying in this letter, I crave family. That's what I'm Mm -hmm. hearing in every single sentence of this. I crave contact with these people. I have a very small tribe and I'm losing too many of them. And right now, buddy, when you're going through that much, I don't want to see you pull away from whoever's left. And I would say that that's not congruent with what your heart wants. And so I'd go with your other thought, which is, is there a way to express my feelings to my family members and reignite and refuse the bonds rather than walking away completely? I mean, there's a time for that. I'm not going to rule that out. And you know Mm -hmm. your family better than I do. But I'm going to tell you that just from reading your letter, buddy, I don't think that's what your heart wants. Right. And I think you have to definitely give voice to the way that you feel about the situation and your own personal emotions. And maybe that's something that you deal with, not with the family. Right. On your own. Like, I I get that. Like, I would be upset, too. I would be really frustrated if if I had the opportunity to say goodbye to somebody, then it it, it didn't work out. And maybe me voicing that to that family isn't going to be productive. Maybe that's something that I have to kind of work on. And deal with. Right. And so, you know, again, final thought, Max, is, you know, I'm so sorry for this. I'm so sorry for everything you've been going through. I mean, to have so much loss in your life is unusual. And, you know, we're all going to lose people, but you have lost way too many. And I think that right now you're just hurting, brother. And I don't want to see you react in a state of hurt. I, I congratulate you that you wrote in, that you took your time on this. I know that this letter came in a little bit ago. And so, you know, I want to hear an update on how you're doing. Um, But let's practice that self-care first. Let's be slow to react in this kind of a situation. Cutting off family members is a permanent choice, and it's something you only get one swipe at. I want to make sure we don't do it in a way unless we're totally prepared for the consequences of that. But right now you're just hurting, brother. Heal first. Heal first. Stop the bleeding first, and then we'll figure out the next steps. Right. And at some point, we don't really have time to get into it now, but at some point we should maybe talk about the difference between fixing relationships versus changing our expectations of relationships. Excellent. Changing dynamics of relationships. That's a great idea. Because that's one thing they said too. I don't necessarily say it's something you have to fix, but maybe you just need to change your expectations of what that relationship is going to be like. Absolutely. Thanks for writing in, Max. Best of luck to you. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will discuss breaking up in an affair. You're listening to Pod Therapy. This week's Thera Producer sponsor is Dr. Ben Don, who I texted about 15 minutes ago and said, hey, your commercial's up. And so he just sent this in, hot off the press. Oh, God. Okay. Today's episode of Pod Therapy is brought to you by Jim's slightly stalkerish booking service. (laughs) Do you need that special guest for your podcast, special occasion, or show you tape? Or show you tape in your mom's basement (laughs) for you and your cats? (laughs) Then Jim's slightly stalkerish booking service is just the service for you. Jim will overtly and covertly pester that special someone for you for as long as it takes in order to secure that special someone you have been you have been unable to reach through traditional proper channels. Jim's slightly stalkerish booking service will go the extra mile of tweeting nonstop, creating into those D- creeping into those DMs, writing Facebook rants, or holding a Bluetooth speaker above his head outside of the bedroom of that guest that you have longed to speak to for so long it takes you <laughs> it takes it takes for you to be satisfied no. until he is put in jail. Nice. Not only will he get sorry, this is there's two more paragraphs left. <laughs> Not only will he get get you that special someone once you're at his event, he will promptly attach his lips to their behind to ensure that they <laughs> will want to come back over and over. Platitudes will flow from his lips like water from the stream as his strings no less than eight compliments into a run-on sentence that you will provide that will provide flatter, confusion, slight concern, and titillate that special person that is now stuck at your event. So remember, if you have a special guest not-so-special guest, or whoever Jim's slightly stalkerish booking service is there to serve and will deliver, or Jim's in jail. (laughs) That was intense. That was deep. If you'd like to join Dr. Ben Don, you can go to www.patreon.com slash therapy. 
That was well written. Yeah, I sorry. Like it. Sorry, I butchered it. That's okay. And you know what? I get results, Ben. Okay. Lori Gottlieb was on the show. <laughs> she was yes. on freaking NPR this week. After us, she was on NPR. <laughs> I know. I saw that. <laughs> I saw the thing on Twitter. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Her entire international tour started with us. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, well, good. She got the, the big one out of the way, so that took away. So uh, as we get to the end of the show, Nick, we do have a, uh, a follow-up letter from a really uh, interesting question. A couple of weeks ago, we had a question about how to break up with somebody that you're having an affair with. Uh, right. And so it was, it was a really good question. We did say, hey, send us follow-up information. So they did, and it's still completely anonymous. We still have no clue who this person is. Um, but here's the here's the follow up letter that we got, which we'll react to. But here's the follow up letter. Hi, guys. I'm the person who wrote asking how to break up an affair, which you discussed in episode 63. I'm writing to give you an update about the affair situation. Since you asked to know more about the story, I'll also try to give you some context. First of all, I actually have no relationship issues. Are you surprised, Jim? <laughs> because I was, too, when this started. What happened can only be described as an almost accidental affair. The man in question is an acquaintance of my husband, so that's how we met. They are actually not really friends, but have a lot of the same friends. I was just curious about him. He seemed like a nice person. We would talk every day. He was sweet and he showered me with compliments. From the very beginning, it was clear that he had a crush on me. Not long after we started talking, he was upfront about liking me more than just as a friend. He is married, but constantly complains about his spouse. Keep in mind that all the information I have about his broken relationship comes through his filter of emotions, so I can't trust every aspect of his problems with his wife. I only know what he wants me to know. Aside from the infidelity, he is a good guy. He was always been really kind to me, but obviously had no sense of boundaries. Even after telling him that I am in a happy relationship, he did not back off with the flirtation. I enjoy good conversation, and I tend to use humor as a shield for my insecurity and need to please people, so I would play his game. Our bond grew from there, and we got more and more intimate. We had a deal to keep the spouse mentions to a minimum, so our conversations were more focused on our past and mutual likings. Well, and sex. To be really honest, this is how he got me to step over the line. Hours and hours of sexting were routine for us, considering we didn't really have opportunities to meet. Since this is a family show, <laughs> it used to be, <laughs> I will skip any colorful commentary about that aspect of the affair, but it was important to be noted. I believe this is the only reason why I got myself into it and stayed for longer than I intended to. We were really good at making each other feel desired. It was different, new, exciting, an amazing ego boost for me. Selfish, huh? I know. The problem is that all this time spent together, either physically or online, ended up having an effect on how I felt about him. Because I developed feelings for this guy. I realized he was also investing too much of his time in a dead-end relationship, maybe genuinely in love with me. We fell for each other. We were friends. We cared and tried to take care of each other. We were supportive and had a lot of fun together. I felt really attracted to him. It seemed like we couldn't resist the pull. We both knew it was wrong. We both knew it would have to end. Maybe exactly because I was starting to fall in love with him and get increasingly attached to him, I began to really see the damage I could cause. I would not be the solution to his problems, and he would only cause me more problems. Also, his true colors started to show. He could be manipulative and demanding. I could see him using his self-esteem issues to make himself a victim in every situation. So no matter what you say, he will always use that against you as a personal attack on him. I do really love him, primarily as a friend, but we could never be together. I feel like I could never trust him. I would always be afraid that he would cheat on me too like he is consistently doing with his current wife. Oh no, I was not the first, I'm sure, and I'm positive I won't be the last. I'm not even sure I was the only one during our affair. Nothing changed in my official relationship. In fact, I think I was unconsciously more affectionate towards my husband to somehow compensate for the mistake. He didn't notice or say anything, and I don't intend to tell him this ever happened. I believe this experience comes down to me being selfish and lacking self-confidence. I've made a huge judgment error, thinking that having someone else give me attention would make it better, or that it would make me feel special. In the end, I just feel guilty and even more undeserving of my partner. 
So, to conclude, I did break up with the guy. I was honest and direct about my reasons. He was able to understand. Of course, there was a little bit of drama on his part, but I was expecting it. We went our separate ways, and in the end, he was reasonable about it. I was a little sad, but it was for the best. We decided not to keep in contact, at least for now. I think I'm still recovering from the entire thing. The guilt and the stress became too much for me. Now I have to focus on my relationship and our future together, especially now. There's a big chance that I might be expecting my husband's first child. Wow. Great follow-up letter. God, I'd watch that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I want this to be a movie. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, thank you for writing in. Wow. Any reactions to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, first off, I'm glad that uh, she said that they decided that they were not going to stay in contact. Yeah. Yeah, broke it up. And and the clean break, not the, oh, let's just downgrade to friends. Like, that never works. Right. It always eventually spills back over. So that was a smart move, the clean break. It's interesting the part about I didn't have any relationship problems. There were no relationship problems. But then I kind of found myself connected to this person because I lacked self-confidence and boundaries, and they were constantly flattering me. And what's interesting about that is as I hear that, I – I think that I have a reaction to that. So, so you you think that that was part of a relationship problem? It is. So because I I heard that too, and and I was thinking not necessarily that it was part of a relationship problem, but it's definitely uh, an individual problem at minimum. At minimum, and it, it it's evidence to me of a vacancy. So there's this theory that I often use in couples work uh, called needs theory. And it it comes from this book that I won't even mention because people don't like it. (laughs) His Needs, Her Needs? That's the one. Yeah, His Needs, Her Needs is is kind of an antiquated text. It it definitely has a lot of sexism and old modeling in there. But the concepts are, are fairly decent to rely on. And the concepts of the book are that in a relationship we have these needs. And, you know, comparable to like oxygen and water and food and sleep and shelter if you take away any one of those that I've just listed from a human being, you will kill them, but not all at the same amount of time, right? Like if I take away your oxygen, I can kill you in minutes. Take away water, I can kill you in days. Food, I can kill you in weeks. Uh, Sleep, I can kill you in months. Well, probably weeks. Shelter, I can kill you in months, right? But all of them are necessary, just not all equal. And so the relationship theory of needs asks, what are your needs in relationship and is the mate attending to them? Because if they're not attended to for a length of time, eventually you become vulnerable to an affair, which is what we refer to as death in this case. So somebody else can attend to that need in your spouse. And because you left it unattended to, they're vulnerable for somebody else kind of taking over that space. And in this case, one of the needs that might have been lacking is affirmation, which is actually part of the needs theory. So if this writer had that need of affirmation, and that was something that wasn't being met by their spouse, eventually an outsider can start, like, making deposits of affirmation, and the other analogy we use is like a bank account. Like, your bank account with your spouse was running low in this area, and this new person started making deposits and ultimately got to a positive bank account where you actually start having feelings for them, which is why the writer talks about feeling like they're in love. So this would be something that, in your analogy, wouldn't kill you in hours or days, but would kill you... You the and slow months, bleed, the slow, the slow bleed, and I've seen lots of relationships that are doing really good, and then one day, pop, there's an affair, or it's all over. And in the pregame show, Jacob was describing one, and, and it's interesting because I have one that actually sounds a lot like that. There was a couple who was great, uh, married for years, things were fine. One day, husband comes home and gives divorce papers to the wife, and she says, "Whoa, where's this coming from?" And he says, I'm in love with somebody else. And she says, how? You never go out. You're never out with anybody. You come home every night. I see you. We eat. You play Xbox. We go to bed. You go to work the next day. Who, who did you fall in love with? It was somebody he was playing Xbox with. <laughs> it was somebody he met in the real world, and they, they signed into Xbox together. And every night, he played video games electronically with this girl. And they would talk all night and play video games. And one of his needs was what's called recreational companionship, sharing fun in enjoyability with this other person. Well, he didn't share any of his recreation with his wife. Every other area of their relationship was sound. But that area, left unguarded long enough, eventually somebody got a corner on that market, and that love bank got filled up in this other person's account, and eventually got to the point where he actually did catch feelings, and suddenly he ended his relationship because of it. So I think Hmm. what's interesting about this letter, and to all people out there, 
do not make the mistake of believing that if you don't have very visible problems in your relationship, that that doesn't mean you need to be maintenancing the relationship and that there doesn't need to still be active, uh, actions taken to continue to fill up the love in the relationship. And so even though his needs, her needs is an antiquated text, the, the needs analysis that comes out of that or like the love languages is another book. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's actually an app now called Love Nudge, uh, which is the five love languages. But you can both like take the test and set like reminders for each other to like attend to the needs of the relationship. Hmm. But things like that are really helpful. And, you know, to this writer who gave us this update, awesome update, incredible story. I think you made the right decision to bring it to an end. You know, her logic is sound. I mean, I assume it's right. a her, but her logic, well, she's pregnant. So, yeah, it's probably a her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, her logic is sound. And and I think that, that that letter to me is actually evidence that, no, it wasn't that nothing was wrong. It's that there were some vacancies. And if we were being proactive with that relationship, we probably could have sealed in those gaps so that you weren't vulnerable to an affair. Now, I do think, would you agree that there's probably some individual work that maybe oh, need to yeah, be done? Because yeah, I guess definitely. with the whole self-esteem thing, I think yes. that's definitely That needs to like, be attended to. I've seen that happen a lot where an individual has low self-esteem or uh, self-confidence and then yes. it becomes very vulnerable to, a, to an affair because you see that and you're like, oh, yeah, hey, this person, you know, gives me uh, – Attention. And they have to look at that for themselves. You're absolutely right. And so, you know, whenever I see a couple come in and there's an affair, a lot of times the victim wants me to place blame on the perpetrator and punish them and then right. sentence them to some kind of personal work to fix it. But more often than not, I want to do both. I want to work on the individual. I want to find out from an individual perspective, why did this happen? But I also want to attend to the ecosystem of the marriage to make sure that it right. turns into a more nourishing place so that that vulnerability we found just can't happen again. Right. And so it's both. It's usually both. And I think a lot of people have trouble with that because they kind of want me to referee. Um, but no, even when I see an individual who comes in and says, I'm here because I've had an affair and I'm here to fix myself, I'll say, let's start with you. And also, I'm going to give you a lot of tools that I want you to take back to your couple. Mm-hmm. And I want you to go see a marriage counselor, too. It's mm-hmm. not just you can't just fix an individual and all of a sudden the marriage is fine. Right. You got to do both. So right. it can be both. But you're absolutely right. And to the writer, incredible story. Uh, please keep us updated on the saga because I think that that's, that's really good. But I like how you yeah. handled it. And, and I'm really glad you wrote back in. Congratulations on your potential pregnancy. Yes. Now put the past behind you. <laughs> Focus on what's ahead. And, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, but wow. Thank you also for being so candid and telling us so much about this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I, if I can, I want to you know go ahead and bid on the television rights because – I feel like I could turn this into a really good miniseries. Bid? Yeah, what are you, what are you going to bid exactly, Jim? What, do you, what have you Sushi. got? Sushi. <laughs> exactly what my question was about. <laughs> All of my transactions are done with sushi. So thank you so much for the follow-up letter on that. Thank you for writing in. So we're at the end of the show, Nick. We have a couple of uh, announcements. The first is that it may, you're hearing this at the beginning of April, and that means next month is Mental Health Awareness Month. We are going to be launching a Kickstarter campaign to try to take this show to the next level. It's funny because just the other day, Nick, one of our therapals um, actually passed by my office, was, was in the office for other reasons, and saw me, and my door was open and popped in and just said, hey, I just want to tell you, your show is my favorite podcast now, and it is the top thing I listen to and she was like you guys need more episodes because i've run out of stuff it's once a week it's only an hour i need more and i said well you know our desire is actually to grow the podcast and to actually do more and so our hope is that in may we can launch a kickstarter and really take this thing to the next level uh maybe even you know doing enough where we can actually do some touring and maybe even you know go out and see you know groups of people out in the real world and maybe even host kind of some group dialogue so but we're excited for it so definitely keep an eye out for that guys because it's coming up in may and we definitely need all the support we can get not just financial but ideas nick and i are not creative people yeah, that's for sure <laughs> and so any ideas and support and even just sharing the message about mental health and hopefully getting it out there into the wilderness Um, as we go through april we're going to be preparing to launch that speaking of mental health awareness month in may i am going to be going to washington dc so if there's any dc therapals in the area i'm going to be there the the first weekend of may and uh, i'm going to be up there for several days uh to lobby congress and to lobby the senate and uh, hopefully try to make the case for increasing some mental health support, um, especially in Nevada, but all across the United States. And I'm going to be out there ringing some doorbells and seeing if I can get some attention from some of our representatives. So, Also, you may That's see right. me on the most wanted list by the end of that. Who knows? I, I'm <laughs> not sure how this is going to play out. <laughs> uh, the do not fly list at a, mi- at at a, a minimum. minimum. Yeah, I don't yeah, know that I'll be I, walking home, so I may right. need to hitch a ride with somebody. 
Uh, other announcement, the book club is coming back because we have Lori Woo-hoo. Gottlieb's amazing book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. So that's out for pre-order now. But by the time you're hearing this, it should have been out. So yes. I think that you can order it. Um, the, the link is in the last episode's description, episode 65's description. Go back, click that link, grab that copy of that book because we're going to be doing that as a book club and we'll probably launch that in May because um, we're going to need to be filling a lot of hours in May as we're trying to do a lot more uh, uh, content to kind of get people involved. So grab that book, and uh, we'll be uh, rolling that out probably in early May. So that'll be coming back as well. Maybe you should talk to someone we'll uh, actually drop on April 2nd. Yes. yes. Yeah, so it will already be out by the time you guys yeah. hear this. And it is the beginning of the month. It is time for patrons. Um, and so we'll skip that first line there, Nick, because that's inaccurate. But oh, we can okay. dive into the Therapods. And uh, I'll do Theropods if you want to do Theraproducers. Rock on. All right. So it's the beginning of the month. So we're thanking all of our loyal Theropods. And I actually have them all lined up this time according uh, to level of contribution. So this is pretty cool. So thank you so much. Ice Blue Scoop, David Pollock, Corey Owens, Lindy, uh, Linda Brandmeyer, Manuela Musakyu, Scoop John B., whose Twitter's on fire, Kate Keller, who is officially the illustrator <laughs> in chief yes. of not only my ink plot test but also the amazing the new comics are that, awesome, it is right? so it's freaking so cool. good did you see my character go super saiyan are you jealous now it's yeah. glorious it's yeah. glorious yeah now you wish you knew anime because you could have asked for that <laughs> instead your character's <laughs> golfing and mine is freaking ripped which is so real life it's so, so real realistic. life it's exactly That's, like being yeah. in this room right. Lori Eltsroth who we literally just saw outside yeah. she and her husband Mike are in town so we literally were just uh, chatting it up with Lori outside Easy, Wh- uh, Easy Whip Brad Kefauver Leon Kassab Peter Van Pelp Van Pelt <laughs> Scoopaholic Malaya Robert Pulse who finally got on board. Good job, Robert Paulson. Scoopstronaut, Dan Martin, Tracy Replogle, a.k.a. Jim's mom, David Younts, Brian Lehman, Gavin Bristow, Carrie Terhark, a.k.a. Nick's sister, Heather Psychotic Scoop Crace, Brooke, Brooks Lyle, who made the fabulous Pegasus with his son Jackson, and I actually have Pegasus in my car. I'm actually going to check with Jacob and see if he doesn't mind if I contribute it to the studio as a as a decoration because yeah, it's great. ICS. So, yeah. <laughs> and uh, just got permission. That was easy. As long as I just put Jacob on the spot, it's cool. Uh, Curtis Kiwi Fruit, Scoop Hanlon, Jake, uh, J- Jackie, and Dustin, aka Scoopy and the Beast, Joseph Pangrazio, Bestie, Frozen Forty Ninth Scoop. Uh, Fred Bashara Jr., Richard Bruins, Lindsay Borders, Lindsay Bashara, Mr. Anonymous, and Blaine Maurer. <laughs> and we want to say a special thank you to our bosses, the Elite Eight, Mysterious, and Shrouded Illuminati members of our fan club, the Thera Producers. Thank you, Smitty Scoop, Jake Schneider, Robert Brownie Jr. Mint, the chairman of the board. Kayla Lansbury, David Data Scoop Vialon, Judy Schneider, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop, Dr. Ben Don, an ex officio board member who says we don't need to announce her, but we're going to anyway, <laughs> Ellie O'Dare. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. If you'd like to hear this episode uncut and unedited and enjoy our spontaneous side projects, including our resurrected book club, you can go to www.patreon.com slash therapy and thank you all for supporting mental health. <laughs> that's all the time that we've had for this week's session we want to thank our landlords the ice cream social podcast and thanks to those of you who contributed to our show today we really appreciate it remember pod therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself help us reach others by opening this episode's description in your podcast app and copying and pasting the link provided into your social media don't forget you can find us on facebook.com slash pod therapy on twitter at pod therapy guys and now at patreon.com slash therapy do you want to submit a question to the show? Ask anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Sanchez. I'm Jim Jobin. Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week. I'm going to run out to my car really quick and get Pegasus, because I do think Pegasus is the right decoration. It should be in here. It should be, since I'm not going to leave my, my penis art. <laughs>